Greetings, growers from around the world. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast. And I got 99 problems in the biodome. Today, Mary Beth Sanchez is back on the line. You know her, you love her. She's a member of our community almost exclusively at this point. And uh, uh, boy, she's just taught me so much about gardening. We're covering four big plant problems today, and we're going to tell you how to solve them really, really fast and how to identify them, most importantly. Before we get into it with Mary Beth Sanchez, though, shout out to AC Infinity, baby. ACInfinity.com. Code GROWCAST15 to get your savings and keep the lights on here at GROWCAST. We appreciate your support, and we love AC Infinity. They make the best grow tents around, extra thick poles. They've got nice, durable, thick siding. Now they have the new side ports. People have been asking for those, and AC Infinity, listen. Plus, they've got everything else you need to grow. They've got lights and pots and fans and their oscillating fans, the cloud ray system. Check out their humidifiers, the cloud forge. How nice is your humidifier? Maybe it's time to replace that. The cloud rays are my favorite oscillators on the market. And of course, their cloud line series, what they got it all started with. All those years ago when we were partners with AC Infinity, all they made were those inline fans and they're the best in the game. So shout out to the entire AC Infinity suite. They've got everything you need to get growing from fans to tents to lights. Code GROWCAST15 works at acinfinity.com. You support us and you're getting some badass, durable grow gear while you're doing it. So thank you to all you listeners using code GROWCAST15 and thank you to AC Infinity. Okay, let's get into it with Mary Beth. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to GROWCAST. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in again today. Before we get started, as always, I urge you to turn someone on to GrowCast. It's the best way you can help this show. Show someone the show. Turn them on to growing and see everything we're doing at growcastpodcast.com forward slash action. There you'll see the upcoming classes like Pestapalooza, the seeds, the membership, and everything. I can't wait to see you inside membership. Speaking of membership, uh, our lovely guest today is hanging out almost exclusively in our server answering all sorts of grow questions. Uh, What an amazing model in the industry she is. She's a regenerative farming specialist, IPM specialist, GrowCast team member, and so much more. Mary Beth Sanchez is back on the line. What's up, Mary Beth? Well, hello, and how do you do? Howdy. It's a lovely day out here in California. Uh, It's been (laughs) raining. Now you're in Trinity and it's raining. We got to get the obligatory weather check. It is, it is. But you know what? We're having off and on sunshine. So it it's all quite lovely. It's not gloomy as 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 it doesn't last all day. You know, it's almost like having Florida in the North Pacific. <laughs> I love that Trinity weather. It's so yeah. nice when it's what you just described. The clouds roll in and then it rains a little bit and then it clears up and then it's sunny. And then, yeah, I, that Trinity weather is, is something special. Oh, the plants are loving it. Boy, they're just jumping up. Oh, my God. I spend the other half of the day pulling weeds because <laughs> they're real happy. <sighs> Got to get out there and weed. Let me tell yeah. you, uh, it's they're that doing time their of year. Part to cover the earth. You know, I got to quit. I quit hating them because they're just trying to cover the soil, but I, I still keep having to pull them up because I don't want certain weeds are extremely obnoxious mm-hmm. and others I can live with easily. But <laughs> if they have stickers, I'm a them. You got to get rid of them. That's right. They're uh, so prolific, those weeds. Uh, and our plant, uh, uh, our, our weed is pretty prolific as well, the cannabis plant. But Oh, we tend to challenge God. ourselves because as growers, good. Mary Beth, we don't want to see a single problem throughout the whole run. We don't want to see uh, one little speck. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to see one you know, little speck, uh, one little burn, nothing. We don't. We want it to be perfect the whole way through. That's the only way that I'll consider a run successful in my obsessive compulsive brain. Well, I've noticed on the Discord, when people are asking questions, I'm surprised sometimes at the little things that they notice on their plants because they are really obsessively looking. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, this is good. This is heightened awareness. They care. I mean, that's this for sure. You can't say they don't so. care. Exactly. <laughs> because if, if you're not paying attention, trouble can sneak up on you. You've seen those pictures too. Oh, yeah. I mean, that is a good point. You know, uh, today's episode, it's all about four big plant problems. Mary Beth solves the plant problems for all the members. It's one of the amazing well, things about membership. You're I... in there every single day. It's like <laughs> being on call for for insurance and people's grows. It, it's I do amazing. have to call on someone sometime for help. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, it happens. 
but we yeah. see these four problems frequently. pretty frequently. Yeah. Uh, and one of them less frequently, but it's, it's a devastating problem. But these first three problems, man, you see it a lot. You see it a lot, a lot. And you can really, like you said, if you're on top of it and you catch it early and you take the correct steps, you can really make a difference in your grow and, and course correct. Whereas if you yeah. don't, you're going to end up with a diminished harvest. You're going to end up with a diminished quality. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's what I'm super excited about today. And you do this all day, every day. I can't thank you enough for being part of the oh, Order of Cultivation. It is a pleasure. I love the group. Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's an honor having you on the team, but you are so dedicated that honestly, you just continue to impress me, Mary Jared, Beth, all the time. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for <laughs> your kind words. <laughs> okay. So let's see. I guess we should just jump right into this. Uh, let's start with the first of our four big plant problems, Mary Beth. I put this one at the top because I see it a lot. This is the classic magnesium deficiency. I see oh, you yeah. calling this out sometimes in our plant problems Frequently. channel. You say, you say, show me a picture of the whole plant. You usually yeah. you usually ask if someone has a leaf, you'll be like, where was this leaf? And then sometimes yeah. you'll say it's magnesium. Yeah. Tell us how to yeah. identify surefire uh, magnesium sure deficiency. Surefire. Well, it's going to be basically revealing itself at the bottom of the plant. So you if it is a magnesium deficiency, it, it'll go slowly up the plant the worse it gets, but it, it basically attacks the bottom first. But it'll be a kind of an all over yellowing and it'll start to develop kind of brownish little patches where it seems like it's even worse. And mm -hmm. it, as it progresses, it just seems to just start to look real ugly, kind of brown and yellow at the bottom. They start to thought, die away. Why? They'll yeah, get all withered and this, die. Yeah, not in the same way as it does when it's getting old. It's like it's too early for that to be happening. And, you know, something's wrong and it's probably magnesium, particularly because of the fact that so often people add their calcium and magnesium together and that's the only magnesium they add, not realizing that magnesium actually leaches from the soil much more quickly than calcium. So you may be short of it and not realize because you thought you had plenty of calcium. You may not be showing any calcium deficiency at the same time. So it could be that it was just the magnesium that was short. And I think people know what you're talking about when you describe that. It's like an early yellowing from the bottom up. Those lower fan leaves get that like real even deep yellow, 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 yellow. Yeah. And then and there's so those like brown the burning brown. spots. Yep. Yeah, but they're usually not real super distinct spots at first. They're more, you know, just kind of blurry brown spots. Totally. And, yeah. Really, really good description. I think people have noticed that. Now, for me, I probably was overwatering my plant in soil because when you're in a soil system and all your nutrition is in that pot, like you said, going to full runoff in soil, not a good idea. Yeah. You're going to push out that magnesium. And then, you know, on the other side of the coin, if you're a synthetic grower, your magnesium is probably coming in the form of your CalMag, which is fine. But like you said, that may cause issues when it comes to runoff or not having enough of the magnesium, depending on how your line is dosed. So Right. And particularly if you're growing in pots indoors, because you have a much smaller growing medium there. So things can get leached out much more easily than, say, if true. you're growing outdoors in the soil in the ground or in a really large pot where you can mimic that condition true. a little better. And again, I think uh, if you correct this early on, you're going to have a healthier plant that even green all the way through. You'll have more vigorous growth. There was a great episode with Nick on the importance of magnesium and all of the plant's botanical functions as it's, you know, taking up water, taking up nutrients, yeah. producing terpenes, all these things. So, so don't sleep on it. If you can green up that plant and not have that magnesium deficiency through, through mid veg, you'll probably end up with a better run overall. Yeah, because any, any, nutrient deficiency that way is going to rob your plant a little bit and you can always tell something's going wrong and stuff starts turning yellow right. almost all of the nutrients are involved in chlorophyll production so almost all of the nutrient deficiencies will have some yellowing involved somewhere along the line you gotta find yeah, the out what it is you can get on top of those things yeah the happier your plant's going to be now, if you find yourself with magnesium deficiency you can certainly increase whatever it is that you're feeding with magnesium in it but you got to be careful, right? So let's say yes. your magnesium is tied to that CalMag. Well, feeding yeah. more calcium, plants eat a lot of calcium, but be careful. Uh -huh. A lot of those CalMags will have nitrogen in it. You don't want to start blasting it with exactly. a 4% nitrogen input right. to cure magnesium deficiency. And an excessive calcium will lock up nutrients too, as, long, as well as excessive magnesium. So 
be careful, you know, sometimes you might not need that extra calcium because you're already at your maximum level. So you don't necessarily want to add more calcium. You might take just some sort of a magnesium sulfate or something to that effect where you can add magnesium without. I think magnesium citrate is another option. You can buy these things and they're just elements. They're they're not going to hurt your plants. Magnesium citrate. I like that. But the first one you said, magnesium sulfate. Epsom salts, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Unscented from the store. They're all the same. Magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. You can find it freaking anywhere. Any CVS, any right. Walgreens, any Walmart. Get the unscented stuff. And I know some people talk about like, oh, Epsom's do this or do that. To me, they seem so gentle. I've added them to yeah. every, virtually every setup that I've, that I've um, run. And they seem mm. to really, really work cleanly and well they're pretty safe you know what i mean unless you're putting in stupid dosages which sometimes people do <laughs> so that may have been part of where you know their bad experience came from but yeah it is pretty easy to work with and that's the magnesium sulfate again sulfur mm-hmm. maybe your plant could gobble up some more sulfur anyway so toss that in at one tablespoon to two tablespoons per gallon You're always recommending that in the uh, Plant Problems channel because it covers two huge ones. The sulfur deficiency, which we've covered on the show before. Frequently reoccurs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the magnesium. Yeah. Look for those growing tips. If they look yellow, you could be sulfur, very likely. Could also be zinc, but the, you know, other things happen with zinc. But anyway, we're talking about magnesium. Yeah. Well, you covered it. You really, you really crushed the magnesium, which is, you know, throw in a little bit of Epsom salt each time or a heavy dose with that one to two tablespoons per gallon to, to green it up. You'll notice your plant really green up. Now I want to stop here though. And before we go on to the next deficiency, talk about this idea of just adding something to Uh. cure a perceived deficiency, because you're going to want to eliminate a couple of other things first. Probably, because there's probably something blocking it up, too. So you never know. How is that deficiency occurring? Is it from right. a lockout because of something else? Like sometimes it's from insect damage where they're, you know, a deficiency can be caused by insects biting into the plant and cutting off nutrients. Overwatering. I've noticed with the sulfur and the oh, magnesium, yeah. overwatering is like the number one thing where if you just fix that, a lot of times the deficiency goes away. You know what I mean? And the temperature as well. Sometimes people expect too much of a plant in too cold of a condition. Oh, yeah. And it really is too cold for the nutrients to be flowing yet. And sometimes all they have to do is heat up the room and suddenly things start going happy again. Okay. So that's a really good point, Mary Beth. I, I want to drill down on this for a second. We talk about the idea of transpiration, right? Mm -hmm. I like what Nick said. Your plant kind of acts as a pump. It's pumping constantly. It's pulling up nutrients and water. It's bringing it up to the trichome head factories. It's using it Mm -hmm. to build all these structures, yada, yada, yada. It's going, uh, it's releasing sugars and exudates back down to the roots. It's releasing CO2. It's a pump that's going. Here's a super important thing to understand about the pump. The hotter the pump is, the harder it works. Point blank, simple. When you slow down the pump with cold, that's exactly what's happening. It's not working as fast. It's not working as hard. It's not taking up as many minerals. So when you're an indoor grower, Mary Beth, and you're in the Mm -hmm. year 2023 and you buy a grow tent, you are given an LED light, a very cool light. (laughs) It's, I mean, it is very cool cool as in, it does not put out a lot of heat good for energy, but (laughs) yes, exactly. So you need to, especially if you're an old school grower, that's just now getting back into the game. No more HIDs, which warmed up the whole half of the house. These LEDs, you better turn off. Here's two huge hacks. You better turn down your outtake fan. And I have a passive intake. I've eliminated my intake. That's just more power I'm saving to keep the ambient temperatures higher. Second hack. This is the big one. Shout out Rizo Rich. Put your oscillating fan clipped to the ceiling, pointed down at your bar style LED light and put it on oscillate. So it's blowing warm wind down onto the tops of your plants. It's a fucking game changer. Thank me. Thank Rizo Rich later. So, oh yeah. Thank you. And Rizo. Oh no. Thank you, Mary Beth. You nailed it. Heat. Uh, So, so sorry. Back back to what you said. That's a great tip though for the tent. That's a great tip. But it's getting too cold. That's, I mean, you, you might just be able to fix your deficiency 
by warming it up. That's a really great point. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because you might just start adding nutrient that you don't really need and you'd still be deficient because it's still too cold. And yes. Then you've got an excess and that's. Uh, you get yeah. nutrient burn. <laughs> yeah. That's a really, really good point. So before you go adding more minerals, I think we did a whole episode on this a while ago. Make sure that you eliminate all those other possibilities, environment, overwatering, uh, pest pressure, all of these things, and then mm-hmm. go and add some nutrition. That is what I would suggest because, yeah, very often when you do suggest these things to people, a light, a light bulb will go off in their head. You know, oh, yeah, you're right. I was doing that. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. We fix that. Problem solved. Oh, God, the Biodome tent is looking so good. And I got that fan up at the top. So thank you for Ooh-ha. bringing that up. All right. Problem number two. We got this. Uh, This one, speaking of adding more nutrients, this is something I see a lot, a lot. And it's probably robbing growers of some yield. But you tell me. Can we do a little role playing, Mary Beth? Do you mind? Sure. Okay. here we go. I just jumped in the plant problems channel in the uh, in the Growcast membership discord. Help! (laughs) No, um. (laughs) <laughs> I just I just jumped into the plant problems channel and I say, Mary Beth, I have some sort of burning on my plants. My plants are burning up. I don't know what's going on here. Let me show you a picture of a leaf. And they post a picture of a leaf and you're looking at the five finger fan leaf and there's some sort of burning, but it's occurring on just the edges of the leaves, the margins of the leaves. Like someone took a highlighter and highlighted the outside of the leaf, but it's burning. It's yellowing. It might be curling up a little bit. And they say it's happening everywhere on the plant. It's happening to the top leaves. It's happening to the bottom leaves. It's just setting in. What's your initial thought? Well, if it's potassium. Oh. Okay. So you'll notice the efficiency at the bottom of a plant if it's mobile. Mm. Because a mobile nutrient is going to spend all this energy at the top, you know, feeding the things at the top and neglecting the things at the bottom when there's a shortage. So if there's a shortage, you'll see it at the bottom where they say, screw the bottom. I'm going to the top because I'm mobile. That's interesting because I usually, I guess I do see it lower on the plant, but I feel like I usually see potassium deficiencies in like the middle leaves. That's okay. But what you're seeing, if you, if you look at it carefully, it's not really that it's lower on the plant. Those are the older leaves because Ah. you know how they kind of grow in a rosette out of every stem. So you know, a kind of an elongated, stretched out rosette. So the older leaves on that stem will be getting it. The bigger leaves will be getting those symptoms before the younger and more fresher. That you just blew my mind. I've never put this together because cannabis growers prune their leaves all the time. And sometimes they'll leave some of the older leaves. They'll pull some of the, and then you have new fan leaves, old fan leaves. You're saying higher and lower, but also consider older and younger. I've never fucking thought of that before. Yeah, because you see how the way it grows out and how, you know, the older leaves, they just start getting bigger and bigger, but they're not necessarily so much lower on the plant as further down the branch, say, further down the stem. Because, yeah, the growing tip is always the smallest part, but then it kind of, well, you know what the structure of the flower is, but as the leaves get bigger, then you start seeing that marginal scorching. And that's the telltale sign. I see it every time. Mm -hmm. It happens in flower. What is it about potassium and the bulking of flowers or the building of flowers? Oh, they just want so much more of it then. Yeah, it is really important during flowering stage to increase that if you can. Otherwise, you will see these little signs of, I wish I had more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Plant will be telling you, (laughs) I could sure use me some more. (laughs) It is certainly uh, uh, demanded in in high dosages because I see it all the time in like bulking. And, yeah. uh, you know, it starts to scorch up and I think you could get more yield by applying so, uh, some more Yeah, potassium. and it's really important to the production of the resins. So if you don't have much potassium, you're not going to have much goo. If you like the goo, you want that <laughs> potassium level at your max. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. It, it is a critical flowering uh, nutrient. And you recommend if you're low on potassium, of course, there are like these PK boosters that are oftentimes supplying the potassium, but the problem with those are they're so high in phosphorus, you know, Mm. sometimes they have twice the amount of phosphorus as the potassium. So I like what you recommend, which is adding something like soluble seaweed powder, which has no nitrogen, no phosphorus. It's got some micronutrients and it's got, you know, 12% plus potassium. 
Yeah. And sometimes you can find it with even higher levels of potassium, but you know, it's just to be constantly retested. And you can find, I found a bottle of nutrient before that was a 0020, which I thought was real good. If oh, you can cool. find anything else, that's a safe level. I wouldn't really want to go higher than 20. I've seen higher than 20, but I think any nutrient when you're going higher than 20% on your, on your levels, it's kind of, you're sort of playing with fire. You know, sure. It's not quite too crazy, but you know, you know how people do. They buy the cha-ching. And the <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of cha-ching, that's why I like having the Epsom salts on hand and yeah. the soluble seaweed powder. These are yeah. cheap, you guys. These are exactly. cheap. You go ahead and you yes. buy a bag of Epsom salt for, I don't know, five ninety nine maybe. And yeah. you can go and order from Amazon even. Just order for off, off the internet or your favorite, you know, down-to-earth, Peaceful Valley type website. Get some soluble seaweed powder. How much is it? It's like yeah. 12 bucks. It's like 17 bucks. Yeah. Compared to the, the resin boosters that you can buy that are a small fortune. And, you know, just because they're advertised as a resin booster and not advertised as, you know, potassium. Yeah, exactly. And the dosages vary, but it's it's about like a teaspoon per gallon or a half teaspoon per gallon mm-hmm. on a lot of these soluble yeah. seaweeds. So it lasts. Very you. small, very small dosage. Yeah. Crazy, super, super crazy. I like that. You're recommending those two things a lot because they fix so many things between the magnesium yeah, sulfate, they do. which is, you know, magnesium deficiency, sulfur deficiency, the potassium deficiency with the soluble seaweed. And mm-hmm. it even helps with your micronutrient deficiencies if you're if you're low yeah. on the micros like iron and zinc and shit like that. Iodine true, and chlorine. True. Pretty interesting. I know some people are a little nervous about, well, what is in the ocean that they got the seaweed from. But normally it's all harvested up in Norway and clean water and things are in the North Pacific and clean water. It's not in, I, I really haven't heard of any sources that are in some toxic wasteland around the United States. At least I, I just, I wouldn't be so super overly concerned about that i'm sure so like i say if you are god bless you go out of your way to find a place where you think the source is good but i don't have any troubles you know with the plants that i've used these things on i think that you um nailed it which is apparently the highest quality kelps and seaweeds come from the north atlantic North Seas, yeah. Yes, they're mm-hmm. they're they're particularly the Norwegian, yeah. I want to say that the process is cold water harvest. I could be wrong about that, mm-hmm. and uh, it's, oh yeah, it's something like cold water harvest, uh, cold pressed, and it's uh, Norwegian, like you said. And they t- they tested uh-huh. these things, and they were super super low, and everything you're worried about, like the heavy metals. Correct. Yeah, they don't don't have that much pollution up in the North Sea. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. And when you look at these products, they're almost always from that the ones that i've seen cannabis facing like for instance yeah, exactly. Ma- maxi crop they're not a partner yeah. they're i don't know anything about them other than the fact that they're a right. big one and they're from there for instance exactly and it's affordable yeah it's not that especially when you realize it's long lasting i mean it's a dry powder you put it on your shelf for years and years it's not going to expire you know you're not going to be wasting your money with it because it really a little bit goes a long way and it, it is effective yes quickly it, because it's super soluble right in the name <laughs> i just don't see a fuck ton uh, forgive me of um <laughs> nitrogen deficiency uh running at least through our server you know when you're using a good soil or a good bottle nutrient line or phosphorus deficiency i like the idea of having magnesium on hand i like the idea of having sulfur and potassium on hand Mm-hmm. Between the soluble seaweed powder, the Epsom salts, and my Demeter's Destiny, which is like a liquid bone meal, it's like a, a right. calcium and a tiny bit of phosphorus. Uh-huh. I mean, anytime I run into a cultivar that's a little bit picky, I'm reaching for one of those products. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I used to use the liquid bone meal, and it reminded me of Pepto Bismol. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it, it does smell like Pepto Bismol. Like Pepto Bismol. <laughs> yeah, the calcium chloride. <laughs> In, uh, it's probably really the same ingredients, you know, because they'd want to settle acid with calcium when they, we just don't know what they're putting in that. Pick yeah. Pick or is it calcium it's chloride or is meal. it, is it, yeah, it is bone meal. It's gypsum. It's drywall. Or is it a uh, calcium bicarbonate? I think it's calcium bicarbonate, I believe. Yeah. That's interesting. Now you said something a long time ago. I'm going to bring up again on this show because it's really, really cool. It's always stuck with me, which is the general rule of thumb that the suffix A-T-E like calcium, oh, phosphate, correct. or magnesium yes. sulfate, 
lends yeah. to the idea that it, it's probably uptakeable by a plant. That is yeah. so cool. A plant and a mammal. That is wild. Uh-huh. I mean, it makes sense. Eight. It's easy to remember. But uh, see? <laughs> <laughs> I ate it and I lived. <laughs> I've been looking at vitamin bottles since you've said that. And I've Correct. been like, oh, this one I could crush up and put in my fucking pot if I wanted That's to. That's right. Yes, you can. Super so, like cool. I say, if you're in a pinch and you need some zinc now, you got might have it in your cupboard. <laughs> you know I love I mean? it. And it, you do, usually, like, you don't need much in your body. Neither does your plant need much, but it's in that really soluble form. So just, I would say, I would say, dissolve it in a thing of water. Maybe one tablet per plant. If you only have a tiny plant, maybe half a tablet, something like that. But you know, you can, you can <laughs> get away with stuff like that. It's so cool. Yeah. Uh, very, very cool. And there you go. The first two problems you might run into, both related to nutrient deficiencies. Again, make sure that everything else is taken care of before you go adding minerals. But equally, make sure you've got some Epsom salts on hand and some sol- soluble seaweed powder. It's like 20 bucks at the end of the day, probably between those two things. And uh, you're yeah. going to have your bases covered for a quick fix when you're running into a deficiency. Yeah. TheFoop.com. We got limited deals going on, everybody. Growcast 20, that's 20% off at TheFoop.com only for the rest of June. You got a few days left, plus free shipping. I think it's on orders over $50. You get free shipping, 20% off with code GROWCAST20. Go and enjoy the deals at TheFoop.com. Certified organic nutrients. I use them on my garden indoor and out. Those aquatic microbes, that fish poop, bringing out that popping flavor. I really, really like what it does to my plants. I really like what it does to how they express their aroma, the sweetener, making the microbes go crazy in my indoor and outdoor garden. I'm pouring this stuff directly on my worms in my living soil bed. No problems out there. You guys know it. You love it. Thefoop.com. And don't sleep on their Foop Mist and their clone gel. Maybe you're a hydro grower. Well, hit them with that Foop Mist. Get that biology going above the medium, above ground. Your plants will love it, covering that phylosphere in a variety of nutrients, micronutrients, macronutrients, and a buttload of biology. That's right. The foop.com code GROWCAST20, only active for the rest of June and free shipping. So go and grab it. You won't regret it. Be healthy, go organic. Use foop. So let's continue on here, Mary Beth, away from the land of deficiencies and into the land of uh, pests and pathogens. I like Mm. this next one. I like this next one. The reason I like this next one is because there's a dead giveaway with this one. I love Mm. diagnoses with dead giveaways because we can, you know what I mean? We can like have people walking away with a really good piece of knowledge that's applicable. So, okay. I'm going to set the stage for this one as well. Some more role playing. Mary Beth, Mary Beth, help me. I'm in the plant problems channel. Can you help me? Okay. All right. Well, my (laughs) plants all fucked up. It's, it's all, it's shit's all fucked up. And uh, it's got these brown spots on the leaves. But I noticed something about these brown spots. They're dark, nasty. They almost look like they're rotting. But they've got this yellow ring around them. It's not just a dark spot. There's a there's a almost like a halo around it. Yes, it's the hellish halo of death. <laughs> it's a hellish halo. <laughs> the Grim Reaper has visited your plan. And he's, it's a coming. It's, it's a trying. <laughs> <laughs> take you down well yes indeed it is true it is uh it is the uh, fungus trying to kill your plants so you do have to get and it is a powerful strong fast fungus it's a fast moving fast spreading killing you've got to get on that one hard what's it called hard what's its name do you, don't voldemort syndrome oh this it's thing. septoria, septoria. septoria it does sound like, you know what? It does sound like Voldemort's uh, arch nemesis. It is. I think he was part of it House is. Septoria, actually, <laughs> if I remember correctly. <laughs> Septoria from Mars. Oh, it's so nasty. <laughs> it is quite harmful. It is quite fast moving, like you said, and it is. Easy to spread with water droplets. Oh, very easy to spread, especially outdoors if you've had a wet winter. But if you you like if you got your soil from outdoors where it got infected with it and brought it indoors and you know even then you'll have it indoors when things start splashing it'll start growing up the plant. Ooh, okay. So let's talk about how it progresses and all of that. But but first, like we said, you know the dead giveaway is you're looking at these leaves. Mary yes. Beth, you taught me to look for the veins when you're dealing with these yes. fungal, bacterial, nasty Very pathogens. Important. Yeah, yeah. The damage yeah, occurs. Confirmation that if you're having a fungal issue. 
it's going to be destroying the veins. In fact, it often emanates from the veins. Every little spot like starts or it's worst in mm-hmm. those veins versus a lot yeah. of the deficiencies you'll see skipping those veins, which is uh, right, way. right. Like they'll go right up to them, but they won't cross that line. Right, mm-hmm. right. And then so with the septoria, you're seeing the damage, you're seeing it on the veins, and then you're seeing these weird little yellow halos. Those spots, yeah, mm-hmm. boy, they just are really telltale. You know, and sometimes that they're usually more yellow. Sometimes people see them as white. And um, there's a few different fungal diseases that will attack your leaves in a really similar way. But, you know, they are all going to move real quickly and be spotty like that. And they'll be pretty... You know, starting off really round spots, but as they grow together, then they'll become weird shaped because they're growing together. That's exactly right. They kind of uh, conglomerate and turn into these yeah. huge nasty patches and, and destroy yeah. your plant. Your plant re- looks really unhappy yeah. when it has septoria. Yes. And it's, it it's you know, I've seen it knocked out quickly, but then I've also seen people really struggle with it. So, oh, yeah. Well, you have to be so hard and vigilant with trying to eradicate that because it can be so strong. And uh, like I said, it, it is a hard one to kill. You've got to really, uh, they, and all the cures for fungal diseases are not necessarily cheap. It can be quite challenging. So let's talk about this. Does it comes in on the soil? You said, and then what? You're watering with your watering can, and, and the it, it works its way onto the plant tissue. Is that what happens? <sighs> yeah. Well, normally it's like it's latent in the soil all the time. But the conditions are right. It gets uh, stimulated and comes up. You know, like when you had too much water for too long and too cold for too long, or you know, different uh, strains probably you know have different conditions that allow them to just suddenly go off, Oof. but. Yes, normally when people are watering, uh, you know, there'll be a certain amount of splashing going on. These spores will start to go up into the plant. Well, um, wherever the spores are germinating and on the plant, they just sort of spew forth their spores. And so they land on the other parts of the plant and they uh, germinate there and they continue to go up the plant that way by just once they've colonized a certain spot in the leaf, they very quickly get some more spores and goes pew further up the plant. And the sooner you can stop those spores from spreading, the better off you're going to be. Mm-hmm. You just got to be so quick with your treatments. So is this one of the reasons you might not recommend people when they transplant, for instance, they'll have those lower fan leaves that kind of hang down into the soil? I've been oh, told yeah. to, I've been told to clean those up because things like yeah. septoria might climb right in. Exactly. And and, they, and if it isn't septoria or something else, it's just it's too much contact with the soil that you really don't need. They're definitely too low to be helping you much with photosynthesizing, so let them go. Okay, that's great. That's great. So you you brought this in on your soil. If you're in a bed, you're really concerned because it's affecting everything in that bed, mm-hmm. right? But either yes, way, it it's going to spew forth those spores, like you said. So you have yes, good ventilation, indeed. and suddenly that's that's working against you. So let's say yeah. you, you find this damage. What do we do? Do we do a double attack on the foliage because it, it has the spores being produced and the roots because the soil is where it lives? Exactly. That's You've got to get hyper vigilant with that one. In fact, I would spray every surface around, you know, if you're inside a tent, leave nothing untouched. You know, maybe take your lights out and gets your thing really disinfected good Hell because yeah. it is such an insidious nasty little thing and it is one of the tougher ones to kill now for the soil there's all sorts of good beneficials that we can add that would help right i'm Absolutely. sure all sorts of uh, bacillus and uh you know labs all yeah, sorts of things exactly. like that maybe trichoderma and all these types that's of things that's another good one yes. but there's also are there not bacteria that specifically antagonize Things like septoria. I'm I'm thinking of the bacteria Streptomyces, which is really effective and kind of kind of designed to f- to fuck up things like septoria, right? Or does it not? Yeah, I'm thinking you know, like uh, the actinovate. Maybe Armory also has some Armory is what I was going to bring strain. up. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that there are some really good strains for this uh, Streptomyces lydicus. Li- I was going to say lydicus, and uh, there's another one. Uh, there's a chromium thing. But anyway, yeah, the, I, the names escape me. It's too much Latin. <laughs> I am not Latin. What do I look like, an uh, ancient Roman? You know, can't they just call it Fred or 
George. Fred and George. <laughs> Fred is really good at, at uh, killing Septoria. Uh, yeah. Uh, that would be much easier. Much easier. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I like okay. Armory because it contains a bunch yes. of those things that we just mentioned. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's a more really nice ingredient. blend. Yeah. Exactly. I might recommend yeah. that. Um, otherwise, just straight Streptomyces. Mycostop is great. Trichoderma harassium comes in many brand names, but it is very good for this kind of thing, too. And especially if you want to do long term prevention. I can't remember the exact name of the bacteria. It's a uh, that does the myco stop. It's escaping my brain again now, too. I thought it was I streptomyces. I could be wrong. I don't think I could be wrong. Oh, so. it's um, I like that myco stop, though. It, it helped when I had a horrible. Yeah. That's another thing you should probably have on your shelf because things like septoria or, you know, even more uh, aggressive pathogens, they work yeah. really, really fast. And you don't want to wait yeah. for this thing oh, to no, ship to you. The thing about micro stuff, too, is, yeah, you want to refrigerate that stuff. If you're not using it, put it in your freezer because it is alive. Uh -oh. And it does need to be uh, refrigerated or frozen for long-term storage. Okay, good to know. I, my my armory is just sitting on my biodome shelf. Maybe I should throw well, that Well, your armory. There might be okay but you know i would be tempted to at least yeah, just toss it in there yeah why not right yeah might as well better safe than sorry rack or something yeah <laughs> yeah put it next to the cheese exactly <laughs> maybe i'll fucking colonize it and then i'll have some super strain of cheesy yeah. strep streptomyce cheese hey you know well look at blue cheese it's all what penicillin <laughs> great stuff <laughs> Okay, okay. So avoid the septoria. Yes on the blue cheese, no on the septoria. How do we how do we prevent? You get some beneficials in there, you don't overwater, right? You said don't let it get too cool. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, temperature and humidity, you know, how much moisture you have. If there's any way to improve drainage in that soil, that'll help with those issues. Mm -hmm. But you know, not knowing where you live and what you're dealing with, that's easy for me to say, but more air drainage though. will help. Yes, yeah. more air circulation. So, Septoria doesn't like that air. And yeah, invite more of that beneficial bacteria or biology to live there. You know, incorporate those things, whether you think you need them or not, as preventative. You may never need to add them again. Or, at the most, you have to add them maybe every few years, maybe every two or three, four years. With trichoderma, you sh shouldn't need to add it more than every five years. Shouldn't need to, assuming if you did it right the first time. And that's a good point. You know, you try to occupy the space with the yeah. microbes that are a beneficial to your plant and b aggressive, you know, very, very pervasive. Yeah, they, you know, are able to multiply on their own for quite some time, at least, uh, you know, until conditions become untenable for them. But normally that's quite some time. So it's not like mm -hmm. it's not like a nutrient where you're going to use it all up in a, two weeks. You've got to put on some more boop, boop, boop. Or the other thing, you know, with your applying uh, pests as uh, pests and predators, you, you have to apply predators somewhat frequently. But yeah, hopefully they'll start they'll start uh, living and multiplying in your systems, and then you don't have to apply them as frequently in the future. Hopefully, this does point to the importance of having a quality, thriving compost in your living soil. Amen. You know, that. we have a resource coming out for the members, so we'll probably end up releasing. That is all about composting. Mary Beth, you're very passionate about composting. Oh, and that's yeah. where a whole host, a consortium of these beneficial microbes can come from and, and protect you. So stay tuned for that. Uh, stay tuned for that composting resource. It's going to be a fun one. Yes. Well, listen, let's wrap it up with the worst of the worst. We saved the best for last. And we are dealing with something that I've dealt with before, something that is devastating. I've seen it shut down, grows permanently. It's a terrible, terrible thing that I would only wish on my worst enemy. <sighs> I'm going to do another role play because I just can't stop myself. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know, Mary Beth, my plants just look sad. They look fucked up. They're droopy. I've been running this room for so long. I have everything dialed in. It makes no sense. The plants are, are stressing clearly. And, and here's the crazy part. I check my IPM. I look at under the leaves. I check my room every day. I'm in there. Usually I've got it dialed in. I just can't figure out what's going on. Everything above ground looks great. What uh, What do you recommend that I do? 
Well, you just gave it away there. It's below ground. <laughs> oh, no. You know that you must check the roots. You must see what's going on okay. in your root zone. Okay. You're probably being attacked by a pathogen in the root zone, which oh. could be fungal or it could be insect. Okay, so that's a, let's pause this role play. And for the first big takeaway, Mary Beth, people don't check their roots as part of their IPM protocol. I, I'm guilty of this. Yeah. Check the leaves and you scope and you yeah. oh and you spray and then you don't you never fucking crack open and look and see what's going on in that yeah. root zone. It's it's so important. It can be so sad and scary when you see those little things infesting your root zone. Thankfully it doesn't happen often. It's one of the rarer issues, but when it does occur, it's like you said, because it's in you know, below ground and you're not seeing it, it usually gets way out of hand before Yes. But there are the preventative measures that you can take to try to ensure that it never does happen. To mm -hmm. you. Well, I want to say first, before we get to our deadly problem, you know, another thing yeah. is when you're checking out that roots, if they look dark and they stink, that's a big yes. no, no. There's a root rot big issue right red there. red flag. Right. And that's, that's not <laughs> what we're talking about right now. But that is another reason to scope your roots. I don't know. Yes. Once a week. I mean, yeah. you just just get in there gently and, and check them out. But back to the role play scenario. I crack open my root ball and I see insects crawling oh, all over my all over my roots. Still dark. not quite time to panic, but if you couple that with sick plants and everything else is okay, yes. you might be in you're probably in trouble. You're probably yeah. in huge trouble. Yeah. Particularly if they look like little brown and gray fat armor covered if it's yes. if really, really in trouble. Fat bodied, sometimes winged yeah. if it's gotten far enough. Aphids, root aphids. Mine were dark. Yeah, they come in different colors, kind of, you know, ranging from blonde to, to gray to black, you know, orangish colors. They're the color of your dirt, usually. Um, they, oh. they, so that makes them harder to see. But yeah, man, they are little. Uh, I'm thankful little I've fuckers. only ever had to deal with them once, knocking on wood somewhere. And, uh, don't ever want to deal with them again, but uh, they are tough and easy to miss because of the fact that they don't emerge from the soil until they are a huge population in there and they are ready to move. They yep. got to colonize another plant. <laughs> That's what happened to my room. You know, I saw the symptoms above ground, just wimpy, slow growing, sad plants, didn't know what was going on. Meanwhile, they're breeding and feeding in the root oh, zone. Your poor plant. Yeah, they get far enough along, and then you start to see them flying around the room, and that's then when you're you know in real trouble. Yeah, then yeah. You're, you're, it's already too late, basically. And it's Boy. another one of those things you got to treat above ground and below ground. Yeah. That's definitely what what you're going to need to do. One of your best preventative measures is if uh, if you get any new material uh, before you put it out with anything else, not only quarantine it, but give it a preventative dunk in something like Dr. Symes or some other kind of a pesticide mix that's safe for your root system, maybe sulfur, maybe whatever it is that you're into using, but make sure to give it that good drenching dunk just to be sure before you let it out. And besides, you know, taking it out of whatever little container it's in to actually see if you can see the roots, how they look, do you see it? Does it look like anything's crawling there? You know, do they look nice and white and bright or do they look like holes are being chewed into them or what kind of condition are you seeing? You are absolutely right. You know, we're worried about going to the gross store and picking something up or, or even something mm -hmm. can, coming in our soil, which is definitely possible. But how you're mm -hmm. going to get root aphids is taking in a cut. That's just st statistically, if you, if you look at the hard numbers, yeah. that's how you're going to bring root aphids into your room is through a fucking okay. cut. One hundred percent. Very, very, very often, yes. Yeah, I indeed. think it's pretty likely. So that's that. That is a great point. The quarantine, the dunk, the the drench, yeah. the whole nine to prevent bringing in this little fucker. Because here's a little teaser that I learned from Pestapalooza. Of course, our our next pest master class is July 29th in San Diego. Pestapalooza. That baby. sounds great. Pestapalooza dot com. Use code GROWCAST. Yeah. Um, it's really, really cool. It's great, Mary Beth. I, I want to do one up near you so you can attend. But but oh, one of the things strange. that I learned is that aphids are generally, they are specialists. There's a cannabis aphid. There's a this aphid, a that aphid, and they're specialists. The yeah. rice root aphid being an exception. This one affects uh -huh. a lot of different. I never really put that together. 
That's why there, yeah. you know, it affects rice, but then it also affects cannabis. And boy, does it Love affect cannabis. Plants. Just uh-huh. devastates it. Absolutely yeah. devastates it. Yeah, yeah. And you will see it on a lot of different plants. So when I saw it, it was on uh, hydrangeas. It was four potted hydrangeas at the nursery where I used to work. Flowers. But it wasn't on any, uh, it was in the roots, of course, of the hydrangea flower. Yeah, it's a flowering plant in pots. And it was only those hydrangeas that had it, those little four pots and nothing else had it. But when I did uh, get into the soil and realized what was happening, uh, every uh, drench I did, so many dead uh, insects came out of it. But uh, they kept hatching. You know, more would come and more would come. Mm-hmm. I did get rid of them after, you know, several dunks. But uh, I think by then the plants were, uh, like you said, too far gone. They had been damaged too much. So what do you recommend for the treatment? If you know, you you scoped your roots properly, but you see these things and uh, you need to drench with something and spray with something. Dr. Zymes would work for both of those things, but I imagine there's more hardcore options. (laughs) Probably, uh, you know, Bavaria Vassiana would be a good option, especially if you're into uh, biologicals. Uh, Met 52 is another similar product that would probably work really well to put in the soil for that. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's another biological really similar to Bavaria bassiana. It acts similarly. Maybe a sulfur drench or uh, Hell yeah. something, you know, but uh, it goes strong. Don't wuss out on the sulfur. <laughs> You got to go full measure on these fuckers. That's exactly right. I think the sulfur drench, some people might do a, like a chrysanthemum extract type thing. Oh yeah. The pyrethrins can work on this. Pyrethrins, you know, it's another thing. Well, sulfur too can be really dangerous if you, if you're careless with it. Yeah, uh, it depends. Pets and things. Yeah, you can kill yeah, cats wanna... with that chrysanthemum, yeah. that pyrethrin. Keep it away from your cats. It dissipates All quickly. All the mammals. But... And the fish and everything. So, yeah, you have to be very careful with that. But it does affect you. It's very effective. So, yeah, when you've got a real hardcore case, you might want to whip that out. Just be careful with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I would say that it's time to go nuclear. And then the rice Uh root aphid is across the threshold of full reset, in my opinion. I'm not going to reuse that soil. that soil. Yeah, fuck no. Definitely not. Full reset. No perpetual Uh harvests after this. You shut down your fucking room and you clean the shit out of it. Yeah, Yeah, that's right. Get very clean. I don't know why I'm so foul-mouthed in this episode. (laughs) I'm passionate about it, okay? I've I've been there. Very. I I did a hardcore reset and I was able to continue on. Now, Now, before you go from this episode and you start freaking out every time you see a flying insect, I would like to leave you, dear listener, with a tip on distinguishing the difference between a fungus gnat and a root aphid. You don't need a microscope. You don't need to get up close to those roots. You will be able to spot from across the room if it's a fungus gnat or an aphid. Do you know what I'm going to say, Mary Beth? Uh, Are you talking about the flying adults? Yes, I'm talking about the flying adults. And I think you were the one who told me this. Well, I know that on the... And the fungus gnats, they they hang their legs down. They got the long legs that hang mm-hmm. down, and they got that Y shaped vein on their leaves, mm-hmm. and they hang out only on in the wings, canopy. Yeah. Really, yeah, yeah, all on the leaves. I'm calling their wings leaves. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, what are the what are the wings of insects other than their leaves? You know, like that's really exactly. I mean, God, <laughs> leaves are just the wings of plants. If you think about it, yeah, I mean, God. <laughs> Oh, bear with me, people. No, no, no. Come on. (laughs) Speaking of the senility, there's something you're missing here. I think you were the one who told me this. You don't have to even get up close. Remember? Their flight pattern. You told me that they fly differently. The fungus gnats fly like a mosquito. They go zigzag patterns. The aphids fly in a straight line like a fucking plane. Yeah, they're on a different mission entirely. (laughs) Yeah, they they like the fungus gnats just hanging around, dropping eggs, looking for some pollen and nectar, just you know, lollygagging the day away. It is zigzagging. They got not a care in the world. Yeah, making yeah. no sense. It's not going anywhere. They got, yeah, yeah, they got no place to go, nothing to do. Where these that ape is looking for a new colony. You know, they're going. I'm going to point B. I'm looking for a new home. I'm going to totally. start laying eggs immediately. 
and populate this new earth. <laughs> That's exactly how I knew something was fucked up because I walked into my room and it was a it was a grow room and something flew across the room and I had to turn my head to watch it go zoop right. all the way across the room. And I'm like, well, okay, right. that's not, I'm not used to that. A fungus gnat flies like a gnat. It's like a zigzag and probably hovering probably want to go pattern. up your nose or in your eyeball. Totally. Just like trying to get at the carbon dioxide. Dumb gnat. Those little scum. <laughs> yeah, totally. The pea-brained little pieces of, all right. Darn sorry. you. <laughs> Get, get rather yeah. aggressive on the nets. No, um, <laughs> that is a dead is a dead giveaway. Is their flight yeah. pattern and well, so okay. if you see I'm a flyer, buying I'm buying that story though. Yeah, that's for sure. I'm, I'm, I thought you were the one who. I'm, I'm stoned they, too. They I, have a yeah. Those aphids have purpose, whereas those fungus mm-hmm. gnats are just killing time. Yep, that's <laughs> absolutely true. Um, so so there you go, dear listener. Don't freak out just because you see a flyer. It's that fat bodied little insect that flies in a straight yeah. line. Them, that's going to be the one that worries you. And check those roots. Always oh, check those yeah. roots. Yes, particularly right around the stem is where those aphids are going to be. If you just can dig gently, gently down your stem a little ways in, if they're there. You will see them. They'll be crawling around and yes. making you very unhappy. Yes, that's exactly right. So mm-hmm. this was four big plant problems and how to solve them quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you for going over these. Of course, the magnesium deficiency, the potassium deficiency, the septoria, and the rice root aphid. I hope you don't get any of these, listener. But if you do, now you'll be able to identify them and fix them. Yeah. May you not receive any of these curses. (laughs) Mary Beth, thank you for always solving all of our problems, big and small. I don't think I saw them all, but I tried my best. You do great. You do fantastic. Where can people find you? I know you're not even on Instagram anymore. You're just solely no, in my I'm, community. I'm, yeah. It's I'm, my greatest I'm honor. Life easy. I'm taking my life easy. You know what? I'm at that age where I, now I can get away with it. So I'm just, I am. I'm in Discord because I like it. Oh my gosh. You <laughs> rock. You absolutely rock. Uh, we are making some big improvements and big changes to membership. If you guys want to check it out, growcastpodcast.com cool. slash membership. Come and hang with Sweet. me and Wolfman and Mary Beth and Rich and everybody in there, and and we'll see you there. Hang in. Mary Beth, we'll let you go. Thank you All so right, much. Take care. And we'll Have see you next one. time. Enjoy uh, summertime, Jordan. Thank you. I will. <laughs> take care. All right. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. There you have it. Mary Beth Sanchez, the greatest. Stay tuned, everybody. Stay tuned. We've got all sorts of stuff coming. Pestapalooza. This is San Diego, July 29th. Go to Pestapalooza.com. We're also working for, uh, we're looking for a venue for LA on the 30th. That might already be up by the time you're hearing this. So growcastpodcast.com slash classes to see all of our classes. We're in Virginia in September for the breeder class. Those tickets are live. We are uh, in Florida in October for Pestapalooza. Those tickets are live. I'll see you there, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Stay tuned. I love each and every one of you. Be safe out there and grow smarter. That's our show. Thank you, Mary Beth. And thank you for tuning in today. I hope your garden is thriving. If it's not, if you have any problems, join up at membership. Like you heard, growcastpodcast.com slash membership will take care of you. Hundreds of hours of bonus content, members-only discounts, giveaways, Ask Me Anything live streams, and Growcast TV, the best show in cannabis. Like I said, we're in San Diego for Best of Palooza. You just heard all the class dates. So uh, other than that, just stay tuned, everybody. Growcastpodcast.com slash seedco. If you need yourself some of our lovely genetics, Rizo Rich uh, coming to Virginia, like I said, and otherwise stay tuned. We've got some good episodes coming. And I'm honored to be able to teach you a thing or two about gardening. All right, everyone. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. If you like the goo, you want that (laughs) potassium level at your max. (laughs) 